We have years on Lake Travis where we don't have very many people go missing and years where we've had many. On a holiday weekend, we have hundreds of boaters, thousands of patrons out here. And the more people we have on the lake, the more opportunity there is for things to go wrong. I started keeping track of missing swimmers on Lake Travis and our efforts to find them in 2010. By keeping my own records, I'm able to keep track of how many people went missing on this lake, how many recoveries we did, and what the circumstances were around each. Year to year, our number of missing swimmers on the lake fluctuates. Sometimes it'll be two, and sometimes it'll be 10. My brother's name is Lonnie Dollars Gray Jr. He was 28 years old. He had a heart for everybody. He loved water, so he loved to swim. He loved his children more than anything in this world, you know, and that's probably the most part that I feel like, you know, it was taken from his children. And his two children were out on the water with him, so. <laughs> I just don't understand, like. He was a great swimmer, so it's like, how did this happen? He was with my dad, grandmother, aunt, uncle, and his two youngest children. My dad called me and was like, are you sitting down? And I was like, yes, sir, like what's going on? And he said, well, I just want to be the one to tell you we can't find Blue Man, and that's what we call him, Blue Man. Um, that's his nickname for the family. My dad was, like, he jumped in the water, and that was it. Like, I do know that my grandmother said that the whole entire time as he was going down, he watched her. And that, it was like she she watched her, her grandchild, you know, go into water, and no one could do anything. He went under and they came back up, went back under again, and never came back up again. The search went on for days and days and days. It, it was an area of the lake that was pretty deep. I believe it was close to 100 feet deep. The longer that search went on, the more resources we brought in. And our dive team went down several times. The 14th day, his body finally um, washed up on the shore. I'm just, yeah, maybe I'm just thinking he just got tired and, you know, the water was more, was stronger than what he was trying, was giving, was able to give at that moment, you know? It's hard. It's devastating. I feel like a piece of my heart is missing. We're all are trying to make it. He was the one who kept us together. And the fact that the family is falling apart without him. It's hard. His children miss him so much, um, his, especially his first little girl. She talks about him all the time, and she's like, if my daddy was here, the things that I'm going through would not be going, I'd be, would not be going through this. If my dad was here, I would have two parties. If my dad was here, like, it's hard. Very devastating. My family and my, if my are banned from here, never coming here. People need to know People need to know about this lake. People need to know, you know, how serious it is. People are, who are from here, they are like, oh, it's just a lake, no, no, it's, no. You need to know how deadly it is. It's very serious, you know. I feel like I had to do this because he died tragically. Lake Travis is dangerous for a number of reasons. For starters, this body of water was not originally intended to be a recreational lake. It was built to be a reservoir. It's a canyon. It's not a bowl. The sides of it don't go up smoothly at all. They used to quarry rocks here, so there are very sharp drop-offs. What might be six feet here in two feet might be 20 feet. 
So after it had been channeled out, it was flooded and everything that was in it was just left there and it's still there. There are pecan groves with full grown 90 foot trees. And when they're doing searches, bodies getting tangled into the trees, it, it's very difficult to get them out of that as well. There's a concrete plant down there. There's homes, docks, cars, all kinds of stuff that are hazards in that water. During the different times of the year, uh, it can be very murky, so visibility may be just a couple feet. When you can't see your gauges, you can't see what's in front of you. So you are literally searching with five eyeballs, which are attached to the end of your fingers. Lake Travis is massive. It's 65 miles of water. It took 30 minutes for Parks and Recreation boat to get to me, 30 minutes. You know, it's a big lake. The Travis County Sheriff's Office is the law enforcement agency that patrols this lake. But Texas Parks and Wildlife also works on the lake with us. Some of these boats have a ton of people on them and just trying to keep a count of all your passengers. Where's everybody at? Is everybody still on the boat? Because oftentimes we've had people, they go missing, they go off the boat, they go underwater and nobody even realized. You've got a guy swimming, looks like he can swim just fine, but we're going to keep an eye on him, make sure he's not in any sort of distress. No mother should go through something like that. It was my son. <laughs> Roger grew up in San Antonio, born and raised in San Antonio, Texas. His personality is just like me. He's the image of me. We're, we love people. We, we're go-getters. We, we love to dance. We love to compete. Very competitive. We want something, we go get it. That's just the way he was. And he's always laughing, always happy. He was doing his dancing and he said one day he wanted to open up his own studio, which he did, he opened up his studio. Some friends invited him to go to Lake Travis. He said two other friends of his were there, two men had a boat. One of them came up and asked him if they wanted to race. They said, no, we're, we're good. A little bit later, that guy came again, insisted. Roger said, okay, I'll race you. Roger put his stuff down and went down there. Roger never came back up out of the water. Somebody dialed to call 911, but they couldn't find him. I tried to talk to my son to tell him to get out of that water because mama was going to come and get him. So I called his friends that night and I told them to pick me up, to take me to Austin because I was going to bring my son back. And then I got that phone call. I was there at that lake and I got that phone call that they found him. They identified him by his, his tattoos. He had um, earrings on. He had stars on his feet, stars on his arms. They did an autopsy. He didn't hit his head. He didn't hit anything. He was a great swimmer. He was a runner. He's a marathon runner. He was a dancer. He should have never gone to that lake. He's not the only life that that lake has taken. There's a lot of other lakes to go to regardless if you wear a life jacket, regardless who you're with, regardless if you're drinking or not drinking. not have Lake Travis, or at least the Lake Travis that we know today, without Mansfield Dam. We are standing in a place that's known in some circles as Flash Flood Alley. This is typical of the Colorado River Basin, especially up around the hill country. That's a region that is very susceptible to flash floods. When we talk about flooding, we're not talking about just a little bit of water. We're talking about massive walls of water. 
Back in 1934, the state of Texas created the Lower Colorado River Authority. One of the responsibilities it gave that agency was to build a series of dams that would bring the Colorado River under some degree of control. Folks knew that there had to be one major massive dam that could hold back these massive amounts of floodwaters that could be created by these hill country storms. And that turned out to be Mansfield Dam. Why is it built at this location? Well, this location happens to be at the bottom of a series of huge cliffs. Put a big dam here and you form basically a big bowl. It's a dam across a canyon that created the lake. So the water can go from being very shallow to very deep in a really short period of time. This is old Anderson Mill Road, right? You see this flat area here, then you got these trees. Then you got another little flat area behind, beyond the trees. Then you have this hill and it's now called Starnes Island. Lower Colorado River came around the back end of this, behind what we're looking at there, down to the, where the dam is. So this whole area where we're at now is dry. It's a lake that fluctuates in levels based on whether or not we're in a drought or we've had a lot of rain. And when the lake is lower, there are areas that come up. Sometimes Island is a very famous one. It would appear that the lake is deep all the way through, but it's not. There are hazards that present themselves as the lake levels drop. Such as dock cables or trees that have grown uh, during a previous drought. Now the lake levels down to that level. Large rocks that are below the surface that people may jump off the rocks to have just a fun time jumping and they don't realize that just feet below is a, a dangerous situation waiting for it to happen. This area of the lake is a canyon with steep drop-offs. And when the lake is at full lake level, we'd be in about 40 to 50 feet deep at this point. And not too much further from here, it will be 120, 130 feet deep. Even as they were planning the dams, uh, there was interest in recreation. Uh, the, the LCRA head office was getting phone calls and letters from folks saying, hey, when will the lakes be ready? And if so, where can we go boating? Where can we go picnicking? The number of people who come to the lakes for recreation has grown over time, along with urbanization and along with the promotion of the Highland Lakes for recreation. You've attracted more and more people to come to the lakes. It sees much more boat traffic, much more swimmers, much more recreation interest than what we have in the other Highland Lakes. It's not a lake. It shouldn't be people there, period. It should have never been a lake. It should have never allowed people to go there and not tell them what's under that water. I mean, the truth, my son would have still been here. They're about the only ones out there on a weekday, fishermen. I'm, I'm Robert Weiss, I own and operate Lake Travis Scuba. So I'm gearing up in my dry suit. The lake temperature is a little chilly. We carry underwater lights. This is my cap, keep me warm, test my air. Getting in the water, it's nice, gravity's off of you. Now you have no distractions. It's all you, it's the total focus of what you're gonna do down there. You hear your bubbles blowing, you hear yourself breathing. That's all the noise you pretty much hear. You do hear some of the boat traffic. For some people that can be a little unnerving at first. To me, it's just, it's just part of what we do down there. It's a nice green environment. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like, let's go see what we're gonna see down there. As my wife likes to say, I got a cape and I like to put on my cape. The last several years, we have collected over $200,000 each year of things in the lake hundreds of cell phones, Apple watches, thousands of sunglasses. Is this it? It's it. One of the most unique finds was a, and we got called out by the sheriff to help 
was a guy dropped his um, prosthetic leg off his dock, and it was a steep climb to his house, and he couldn't do it without his leg. So we, we helped get his leg. The lake is like this living thing. It's constantly changing, so you never know really what each dive is going to be like. It's going to have a little difference each time. There are things that are underwater that, that somebody above the surface doesn't consider as a potential obstacle or hazard under the lake. We have something called the shaker plant, part of the construction of the dam. It's a rock crushing plant. Down there, what you're going to see is the footings of the old timber structures. You're going to see concrete blocks that were part of the uh, tram system, an old pipe that's down. It's a rusty old pipe, so you got to be careful diving around it. Uh, it could cut you, it could cut your, your suit. And just basically old structural pieces that were part of the plant. When they filled the lake up, they took a lot of the structure out, but things that were planted into the ground still remain. There's an old barn uh, down near the lakeway area, down there. There's like three walls of it still standing, two or three walls of it still standing. Most of the land that now forms the, the bed of Lake Travis was, was agricultural. It was ranch land, it was farmland. There's a lot of trees underwater, right, uh, at varying levels of depths. Either you got two sets of trees, you got tall trees, pecan trees, nice, big, tall, beautiful trees, big, long branches, not much of an obstacle or hazard, but you've got a lot of trees that have like fallen down, collapsed together, branches grown together, serious obstacle, serious hazard. Yeah, we're, we're about 50 feet away from the bank. You'll see below us here is a line of trees that are about 20 feet tall. The trees start about 60 feet in depth, come up to about 40 feet. And some of these coves that we'll go into, especially when the water comes down, you'll see other types of trees. I'm not sure if they're pecans or other trees coming up in the shallow areas. When the lake is up, you'll see these trees that are growing off the side of the ledge. This is what the trees look like underwater. So you'll see that these trees are, are growing up and somebody can jump in, be swimming along and not realize that we've got these tree limbs protruding up. When someone reports someone missing, it's, it's patrol deputies that typically respond to the scene first. And when Lake Patrol shows up, they start doing shoreline searches and sonar searches. You can see rocks, boulders, you can see it's probably we just pull over there and pick a up tree them. that's been down. There are lots of things on the bottom of the lake. Trees in particular, as if you get caught down there and someone has to come rescue you, and then that person gets caught, now you've got a real dangerous situation. Over by Valente, there's a, an old pecan orchard. But once we see that that's what we're diving on, we won't dive it. It's too dangerous. Just replaying the, the day, the day and the events and what occurred and where we were and it just happened so fast. We had no idea, he had no idea that we were in a dangerous area. Dreadful day was uh, May 5th, 2018, it was Cinco de Mayo. Manuel was just kind of a good old country boy guy. He gave everything to his family, his daughters, his grandkids. They were number one. He had been shopping for a boat for years. He goes, I always wanted a boat. I always wanted a boat. And I would see these pictures of boats from years before, two or three years before. And I was like, well, why don't you get one? He says, I don't know, I don't know. I was like, you know, you always take care of everybody else. If you want the boat, you should get the boat. It's like, you know, you're right. We got out on the water and rode around. There was a lot of people here. It was Cinco de Mayo, it was a nice day. So there was a lot of people here at the park. There was a lot of people in the water. There was a lot of boats. You know, we weren't drinking, uh, no alcohol, nothing. It was, you know, early in the day. He was trying to anchor and we had a 75 foot line. When he says, I can't anchor, it's like, you know, it's a 75 foot line. So we were both shocked that we couldn't anchor. Uh, we didn't know at the time that we were in anywhere between 150 to 
175 foot water. He was a very strong, um, healthy, good swimmer. He says, I, you know, gotta go, relieve myself, gotta go, gotta go. And so I'm in the front pulling up the line. I turn around and when I turn around towards the back of the boat, I could see that he was in, he was in trouble. And he's like, row the, the boat. And remember we couldn't anchor. So with a lot of traffic, what's happening is we're hitting up against the rocks and we're, we're drifting. So he was getting pulled under and he just never made it to. So I'm struggling to get the compartment open where the, the safe vests work. The compartment went, was stuck. I couldn't open it. By the time I got it open, grabbed a vest and shut it, it was just too late. The last image that I have of Manuel is um, just struggling to stay above water and he was just running out of gas. And, you know, because his body wasn't recovered, we don't know. We don't know if it was because it was cold, because he had a heart attack, because he had a cramp, uh, because of the undertow, you know, we'll just never know. It's rare for us not to find a missing swimmer in Lake Travis. We make it a point to look until we have exhausted every single thing we can possibly do. Manuel Salas was reported missing and we were not able to find or recover him. Loved ones are down there, not recovered. I'm not the only one. And it, it, it just, it makes me, it makes me sick to my stomach. We get called out on average, I would say 10 times per year. The primary mission is, unfortunately, is searching for drowning victims. Jeremy, he want, he's, he's debating about going finless. This is a volunteer position. Everyone has other jobs besides just the dive team. When a dive team is called up, it's a recovery. Giant leech. What we're doing right now with the rope that you've seen back there, arc searches. Imagine a windshield wiper going back and forth on a windshield. So we're starting it at one point and just slowly allowing more rope to go out and that diver will go back and forth and systematically eliminate one piece of area at a time. This job is very dangerous. Humans weren't designed to breathe underwater, right? So we take our air with us. We are limited to how far or how deep we can go based on that air consumption. We also have what's called an ROV, a remote operated vehicle, and that has helped us in locating uh, drowning victims as well. I can place it in the water, run it out 25, 35, 45 feet. Once you get deep into the water, the light penetration narrows and it gives me a narrower view. I may be able to see three or four feet in front of the drone, maybe 45 degrees uh, on either side of the camera lens. The rest of it fades away to gray. There have been times when using that ROV, they have been able to identify the missing swimmer. So when the dive team goes down, it takes that risk of going you know, 75, 100 feet deep, they know they're taking that risk because we've found the person we're looking for. So we're in the area of the, of the lake where Manuel Salas was last reportedly seen. We have a buoy that is that marks the area. We have searched this area over and over again over the years, and we continue to do so. The search area is massive. When he was reported missing, the boat he was reported missing from was drifting, and there was no exact location known. So we're searching this entire area. I got on the team to bring closure to families, and the fact that at least 10 families didn't have closure, yeah, that bothers me. They will never be recovered. At this point, they are their remains, right? And they're probably buried in silt, so we'll never find them.
This lake is too deep to just put a diver in and say, we think they're around here somewhere, go search the bottom. They can't do that. They only have a limited amount of oxygen. The deeper they get, the less time they can spend at the bottom. They're not going to deploy unless we know that we've found something that we believe is credible enough for them to search. Just as every airport has an air traffic controller, and this is the air traffic control for the diver, you need to realize that the diver is working under a very dangerous and complex uh, situation. She's in the dark, it's very cold, she can't orient herself. We've got a vast area to search from. We have to search that in almost zero visibility. The water is very dirty, and when we're working on the bottom of the lake, we are stirring up the silt. Visibility typically goes to zero really quick. That's what makes it very difficult for us to locate sometimes, and sometimes it takes several hours or even days. It might even take weeks or months or years in, in some cases, because our operating depth is, is a set ceiling or a set depth, and we don't operate below that. The Travis County Sheriff's Office dive team can dive to about 100 feet and no deeper. And that's because the equipment we have isn't built for them to go deeper than that. So that is the, that's the depth at which we stop. But there are other diving professionals who can go deeper than that. When we have a situation out on the lake of a drowning victim, we'll, we'll get called only when the, the Travis County Sheriff's Office has reached their limit of, of either capability, meaning the depth that they can dive to, or they've expended their options and, and the family still wants a, a recovery. When a family calls out for help, it's really hard to say no. I've got a skill that I've been taught. I've got a familiarity with the lake. Somebody needs to have closure. As creepy as it may sound at first, which is the way I thought it would be, you, you kind of desensitize to that moment. Typically, we're going to bring in somebody who's a rebreather diver, which means they can stay down longer. What we're going to do is we're going to go down, first mark the area where the victim was last seen. We're going to set a search pattern up, and we're going to conduct a search pattern of various types. If we find the body at that moment, what we're going to do is we're going to tag the body by sending a flotation device up to the surface attached to the victim in a way that's been described to us uh, by the Sheriff's Department. Look at that, the first one. Next step is usually gonna to be to secure the body with some kind of lifting device so that they can bring the body up and then continue on with their work. Okay. The first time it happened uh, that we found the body, you kind of take your breath away for a quick moment. Fortunately, we've never seen the face of a victim. The bodies have usually been in a face down position into the uh, bottom of the lake. When you get down there, it's like anything, you're, you're just doing your job. And you, you just kind of disassociate with the fact that it's a body and, and you're, you're bringing something up from the bottom. Since 2010, we've lost seven swimmers in Devil's Cove. That's an area where people tend to connect their boats and just party all day and have a great time. There's people everywhere, so I think that sometimes there's this false sense of security. The majority of boats in there are going to be either, you know, someone rented it or they have a hired captain or something like that. That's the majority. Really when we come into Devil's Cove, one of the things we're looking for is just people being safe. You make sure that there's not people that are swimming too far away from their boats because we are in 40 feet of water right here. Some of these boats have a ton of people on them. 
and just trying to keep a count of all your passengers. Where's everybody at? Is everybody still on the boat? Because oftentimes we've had people, they go missing, they go off the boat, they go underwater, and nobody even realized. Alcohol, boats, and water. It's a crazy time. So yeah, I mean, you get people jumping off boats, you get people swimming kind of like we are in between channels. People think that, you know, I'm on a boat, I'm gonna drink, I'm gonna go swimming. I don't know if you've ever tried to swim intoxicated. It's not as easy as people think. Especially in 40 feet of water in these conditions. It's a whole lot different than sitting on a raft in a swimming pool versus an open body of water. Devil's Cove is a good example of the fact that despite the fact that there are people everywhere around, when someone goes into distress and goes down in the lake, even if you're right there next to them, you can't necessarily find them and help them. Devil's Cove, which is right down there, is just a phenomenal spot. It's this really cool cove with these big walls. If you go out to Devil's Cove on a Friday, Saturday, you'll see mostly bachelor bachelorette parties. It's just the most fun lake in the U.S., in my opinion. <laughs> Boat is ready if you guys want to start loading your stuff up. 85, 90% bachelor bachelorette parties from out of state. That's our main customer, and they're amazing. They're great. Tessa's bachelorette party. <laughs> I run all my boats like a bar. So like at a bar, you can get cut off if you're visually intoxicated. We pull you up, put a life jacket on you, get the kind of mom or dad in the group to like, look, watch after your, your boy or girl here. You want to set the tone right of, I'm the captain. These are my rules. If you don't buy them, we're heading back to the dock. No refunds. I'll make an announcement once we get into the cove and get anchored and set and tied off. I'll say, guys, pool's open, safe to swim now. Until then, everyone has to stay on the boat, okay? You gotta keep an eye on people, you know, the whole time. You're definitely a babysitter slash captain. You know, you can see someone thinking about doing something stupid. You know, he's like, I'm gonna get him before he does that. You know, like jumping off the boat or doing something. So I always have my guys moving around, keeping an eye on all, everything just to kind of mitigate any potential risk like that. All the boats leave around 10, 30, 11, and it'll be three to four hours, and then the next group will be three to six or seven. And we do it like that because we want all the boats leaving right around the same time so we can all tie up to each other. Everyone's ready to leave at about the same time so we can all depart at the same time. 90% of all the boats out here, you'll see our rentals, flag or not. It kind of keeps the, the lake safe when you have captain's boats. Liability-wise, all the captains know what they're doing, so it keeps things in order. You know, if the boats are all wrapped up in Devil's Cove and there's a line of 20, 30 boats, and, and there's something that we need to address that's in the middle with the amount of anchor lines and the amount of swimmers in the water, we typically have to park at the end and walk across all the boats to get to the boats in the middle. Really, we're just trying to address those slack lines there in the lake. The problem with the line, as you can see, it sticks off from the 20, 30 yards off the front of that boat. So we had that boat that came around the corner and thankfully somebody waved him off, but he was traveling right across that line and that line can get right into his propeller, foul his engine. A lot of party barges go to Starnes Island. It is a party location. It's a place to have a fantastic time and people do, but People who are out there enjoying that need to be aware of how much alcohol they're consuming. On a hot, sunny day, it'll take a toll on you much more quickly. People who've jumped off the boat, people who've been swimming near the boat, some have fallen off the boat. Sometimes these incidents have happened when the boat was in motion and other times when the boat was stationary. Several years ago, there was one drowning victim. They were out on a party barge and they're coming back from the island, back to the marina and the young lady sat up on the rail on the top deck for a photo and an accident occurred. She fell in and, and she drowned out here. These are our party boats. They're over 30 feet in length and have more than six passengers. So they're required to have all those different types of inspections. They'll rent one of these boats. These boats are gonna have a hired captain. Uh, depending on the amount of people on board, they'll have extra deck hands. Uh, they'll be CPR certified. Some of these boats have restrictions on how many people they can have up top. Because you can see right now, I mean, 80% of the boat's on top. Hey, Wade, try and do a rough count of how many people you think are up top. Yeah, you know what? Swing it. Swing it. You got any ropes we can tie off with? How many y'all have on the, the charter today? I mean, you can see they have a lot of people up top. 
I just want to look at their stability letter, make sure it didn't mention, you know, maximum amount of number of passengers they're allowed to have on top. Because the biggest issue is the stability, and you can see they're just big barges. They're prone to capsizing, so they're all good on that end. The thing that really caught my eye was just the amount of people on the top deck. I mean, you could see that there was, what, five people on the bottom, and everybody else was on top. That's what makes me want to take a look at the stability letter. Make sure they're within compliance, and they are. Since 2010, unfortunately, seven people who were out on party barges on Lake Travis went missing in the lake and were ultimately recovered. Tragedy on party barges runs the gamut of situations. I've had to call an ambulance last year on a girl that happened to, and we got her fluids and she was totally fine. Didn't have to actually go to the hospital. Um, but that would probably be the most common, it would just be dehydration, you gotta stay hydrated. Oh, alcohol is definitely a factor on Lake Travis. Boating while intoxicated is every bit as illegal as driving while intoxicated. The amount of drownings out here, and I know a lot of the ones that I've personally been a part of, alcohol was a factor. A lot of it is just not making great decisions. I mean, sometimes accidents happen and, and there's just, there's really nothing you can do. How's it going, guys? Good, stay game. We're gonna pull up right here, do a water safety check real quick. Is this a uh, rental or a personal? Yes, sir. Are you driving for them? Yes, sir. Okay, if you could show me, just hand, make sure everybody's holding a life jacket for me. The lake can be dangerous, but if you put on a life preserver before you get in the water, it takes a lot of that danger out of it. And I know other people have said it before, but we have never located a missing swimmer that has a life preserver on. How are y'all doing today? It's awesome seeing all the kids in life jackets. That's what we want to see. My name. One of the things we take the most seriously is the life jackets. Uh, if a boat doesn't have the required amount of life jackets, they're going to be issued a citation for it every time. That's how we handle it out here. If you could just show me two more life jackets for you two. A bunch of kids, they were all wearing their life jackets. That's great. Um, that's what we like to see. There are also free life jackets in Lake Travis. You can go to the parks and you can grab a life jacket there if you didn't bring one with you. Use those for your safety and just turn them in when you're done. We are labeling life jackets that are going to go out to loaner stations. We have loaner stations at Mansfield Dam, Bob Wentz Park, Hamilton Pool. So when people come to the lake, if they get on a boat, they want to get in the water, they don't have a U.S. Coast Guard approved life jacket, they can borrow one and return it. We have students from Westlake High School. It's their senior service project. They label life jackets. We also are able to do some education to help them have safer behaviors around water, specifically open water. Our number one effort to keep people safe on the lake is to educate. We are constantly finding opportunities to talk to the public about the dangers of Lake Travis, encourage people to use caution and to, to follow safety protocols for their own safety. A traditional approach to uh, trying to get information into people's hands in today's world is, is, uh, is limiting because people get a lot of their information from things like social media. We wanted to make sure that we had very clear-cut, very uh, social media friendly messages that could go out. Things that are simple for families to be able to do when they go and spend an afternoon at the lake. Well, Be Lake Wise is a, is a comprehensive safety campaign that looks at social media, koozies and things of that nature that have very succinct, very simple safety messages that will allow people to recreate uh, more safely on the Highland Lakes. We have a lot of signs at the boat ramps and, and in terms of this particular campaign, Social media was a much better way to be able to get the information in front of the people, the most people, the most efficiently. You have much better reach with social media, and you can direct it much better with social media, and you can update your messaging as the year goes along and refresh your messaging. People scroll on their phones a whole lot, so if you use the major outreaches for social media, the different types of, uh, of apps that people have on their phone, you can get information in front of them much more efficiently. Do you know what the LCRA is? Lower Colorado River Authority? I don't know. 
No, I've never heard of them. Vaguely, I've heard of the acronym, and I think I've heard of the group or organization before. I personally, no, do not follow them on social media. I personally don't follow them on social media. I haven't seen any, like, social media presence of anything. It's hard to quantify whether our education efforts and, and life jackets on the lake have been affected because there's no way for us to know whether or not a life was going to be lost that wasn't because of the life jacket. I can't help but know that it makes a difference. So we measure success by being able to help the public. To help one person, we'd consider that successful. We have a 20 minute clock from when the first responder gets on scene until we switch over to recovery mode. We have our boats, which are stationed around the city. So if a call comes in, we'd have to connect our boat, get it launched, and that takes a lot of time. Kind of a new thought, a new trial we're running is to put paramedics on the water so we can, we can get to those patients even quicker. One of the new programs we're trialing is to put paramedics on the police department boats so we not only have a public safety presence on the, uh, the water, we have a medical capability on the water so we can get to them even quicker. The fact that they're actually on the water and most of the time out on patrol, it increases their response times dramatically. And we're already showing some successes down here on Lake Austin. We rate our successes right now just on are the paramedics being utilized. And we've had boaters who are in distress. We've had people who just live near the lake on these houses that overlook the lake who call 911. And having a paramedic who's able to get there via the lake as opposed to driving long ways in an ambulance. So Lake Travis is a huge lake. There's a lot more boater traffic. It would be really beneficial to the public to have rescue and medical capabilities on the lake for when there's there's people on the water. Right now with just boats being on uh, Lady Bird Lake and Lake Austin, it's good coverage, but we could do a lot better. It'd be the natural progression if we move to the bigger coverage area to move up to Lake Travis. In January, I lost my mother to COVID and then to lose a son, it's a pain that'll never go away. I didn't get to say goodbye. He didn't know that was gonna be his last breath. Like maybe he was on a trip and he was gonna come back and pop, pop got back in, into our life. I thought maybe he got picked up somewhere and someone maybe found him and, and they're, they're, they're patching him up in their house or something like, and it still feels like, you know, he's coming back. It still feels like he's not gone. A reminder when people come in, make sure everyone's wearing a life vest when you come in. Um, Manuel was very strong. He was a great swimmer, in excellent health. He'd been here at the lake many times. He grew up in the Austin area. He wasn't a stranger to Lake Travis but we weren't familiar with the boating on Lake Travis. Those are two different things. I want people to know that this lake is, it's intended to have fun. And I want people to have fun, but do it safely. I would say it's as dangerous as you allow it to be. If you wear a personal flotation device, you're pretty safe. If you swim without one, if you are drinking alcohol on the lake and you choose to get in the water, Lake Travis is no different than any other lake that we have in the state of Texas or anywhere else, and that is no one should go to one of those lakes without doing some homework before they go. So people say that the lake is a dangerous lake. Driving to the lake could be dangerous. Going to the grocery store can be dangerous. Like anything, you have to know what you're doing. It doesn't take a lot of knowledge about being safe on the lake. Simple things, a safety flotation device for everybody, whether you're a strong swimmer or not, knowing the navigation of the lake and being prepared, listening to the people that rent out the boats to you. Any body of water you could consider to be a hazard. 
it's no different than anything else out in the world. It's no more dangerous. The Lake Travis has a lot of activity on it, and therefore there's more situations that occur on Lake Travis.